Now in the next three stanzas, he gives us elaborate descriptions of these pictures themselves. Stanza 2. Heard melodies are sweet, but those aren't heard are sweeter. Therefore, ye soft pipes play on, not to the sensual ear, but more endeared. Pipe to the spirit ditties of no tone. So he says, he looks at um, the urn very keenly and there is a very famous picture of uh, uh, Keats sitting like this with his hand on his chin and looking at something. So when I read this poem, I always imagine him sitting like that and looking at this urn uh, very carefully and uh, trying to uh, give us a very detailed description of each and everything that he sees on the urn. So this, these lines are very famous, you must have heard them before. Heard melodies are sweet, but those unheard are sweeter. Therefore ye soft pipes play on. So what does he mean by that? So he says, music that has been played or songs that have been heard are sweet because we uh, like many songs that we hear. Music we know is something very beautiful to listen to. So he says that heard melodies or heard tunes are sweet, but those unheard are sweeter. And here on this urn, you see a musician playing a pipe. And we know that when somebody plays a pipe, definitely music would come out of it. Of it. But then we are unable to hear or listen to that music because it is uh, a picture that is represented there and the music that is emitted out of the pipe can never be heard but we know that the music is there because the man is playing the pipe and so he says the unheard music must definitely be sweeter than the ones that we have heard so he says play on play on not to the sensual ear and he says this musician plays his music not to the sensual ear sensual ear in the sense uh, to the ear of uh, a physical uh, a listener he is not playing to the physical ear because we cannot hear it then who is he playing it to he is playing it to uh, something beyond physical but more endeared but more endeared pipe to the spirit ditties of no tune okay so this uh, song uh, these um, songs are more precious because they are played directly to the spirit. They are not played to the human here. They are not meant for the human here, but they are meant for the spirit. Ditties of no tune, uh, no tone. Ditty, a ditty is a song. So these are ditties of no tone because we cannot hear them. And they are directly played to the spirit. Uh, there is no intermediary human ear to listen to this song. It directly appeals to the soul. So that is why he says, play on but not to the sensual ear, but pipe to the spirit, ditties of no tone. So that is what he tells the musician, carry on, continue to play. And then he looks at um, the man, the the one who is playing the music he seems to be sitting under a tree so there is the tree so he seems to be leaning on the tree with his legs you know uh, just uh, stretched in front of him a handsome young man so he says fair youth beneath the trees thou canst not leave thy song nor ever can those trees be bare so he says you are forever tied to that music of yours because you can never get up from there and just walk off. So as long as this urn exists, you would be there and you would continue to play your pipe and you would continue to um, emit notes of music. And those trees uh, can never be bare in the sense the leaves of those trees can never be shed, they can never fall off because they are always going to be green. Uh, they are not going to turn yellow or fall off. So that is why he says, nor ever can those trees be bare. So that is what he tells to the musician. So they are etched forever. 
on this urn and then he goes on to the next person on the urn that uh, I mentioned earlier that there is this lover a man who is chasing a lady a young girl and so he tells this now he's talking to this uh, lover and he tells him bold lover so why is he a bold lover because he is attempting to chase and catch you know, hold of uh, the girl who is running away from him. He is not a timid one who sits there, but he is a, a, a bold man who is determined to achieve his love, to fulfill his love. So bold lover, never, never canst thou kiss, though winning near the goal yet, do not grieve. So he says, you will never, never, he repeats the word never, never in order to you know, emphasize that um, this this bold lover he will never ever be able to kiss this lady uh, he has come very close to the goal he is just the, the the lady is just an arm's length away from him he could get hold of her if he just extends his arm but unfortunately he'll never be able to do that and so he keeps consoles him and tells him to not grieve don't feel sad because for a lover it is very sad you come so close to kissing your lady love and you're not able to do it that's very sad but do not grieve says Keats and how does he console this young lover he tells him she cannot fade though thou hast not thy bliss forever wilt thou love and she be fair so uh, this is how he consoles her consoles uh, him the lover because he tells her don't grieve because this lady love of yours she's ever going to be in front of you she's always going to be in front of you and though you have not had your bliss though you have not been able to achieve bliss by kissing her but you will always have your love your love is going to remain young and fresh forever and this lover of yours who stands in front of you she is going to be beautiful forever she is not going to be touched by the passage of time she is always going to be young and fresh and beautiful as she is now so someday if suddenly you spring to life there she is right in front of you beautiful fresh as she had been whenever she was etched on this uh, urn and then you can kiss her so don't lose hope your love and your lover is going to remain eternal forever unchanged on this urn so that is stanza two now stanza three a happy happy bows thou cannot shed your leaves nor ever bid the spring adieu and happy melodist unwearied forever piping songs forever new more happy love more happy happy love forever warm and still to be enjoyed forever panting and forever young all breathing human passion far above that leaves a heart a heart high sorrowful and cloyed a burning forehead and a parching tongue so he says uh, now he, you can see a repetition of words here. His excitement cannot be contained. So he says, "A oh, happy, happy boughs. Boughs are branches." So he says, "The he is addressing the branches on uh, the urn and says, how happy you are, how fortunate you are, because you cannot shed your leaves at all, and you can never." bid the spring at you it is springtime forever for you your leaves are never going to fall off and you're always going to be in the spring season there will be no winter for you there will be no autumn when your leaves fall down there will be no uh, uh, there will be no winter when you're uh, when you get frozen in the cold you are going to remain forever in the spring season isn't that wonderful he asks the boughs so happy happy boughs that cannot shed your leaves or ever bid the spring adieu adieu is bidding farewell so these boughs are going to remain evergreen and then he talks to that musician who was playing the pipe and he says and happy melodist unwearied so this man is never going to be tired 
unwearied he can continue to play the pipe as he has been playing it for centuries his songs are ever going to be new because nobody has ever heard it only if you hear it does something only if it's exposed to the world does something become stale but here since his songs are never heard by anyone they are going to remain forever new and the melodist is going to play on unwearied he's never going to tire of playing music because again he is just stuck there in time and as for the lovers he says happy more happy love more happy happy love uh, forever warm and still to be enjoyed because their love it um, it kind of is eternal it is forever warm and still to be enjoyed forever panting the excitement the panting actually signifies excitement so the excitement of the love and the youth it's never going to die so it's always going to remain as passionate as it has been then and all breathing human passion far above that leaves a high heart high sorrowful so he says whereas when you compare it to human passion the breathing human passion uh, what happens to human love human love always gets cloyed you are so much in love with somebody but then after some time once you uh, either you achieve your love you uh, get united with your lover and then you slowly start losing your excitement you're cloyed with your love you're kind of uh, satisfied with your love you're saturated with your love and it ceases to be interesting anymore or the other other hand on the other hand you may not achieve your love you may not get the person that you fell in love with and as a result your heart becomes sorrowful so both these extremes either you are rejected in love or you get what you wanted but then you lose your interest in it so this is what happens to human love so it leaves the heart high sorrowful or it leaves it cloyed and uh, it results in a burning forehead a parching tongue so um, um, a human love always trouble creates trouble either you have a burning forehead because you don't get what you want or a parching tongue because you are tired of what you have got or maybe because you don't get your lover you are so unhappy so the parching tongue may signify the unhappiness or the cloyed state so whatever it is your love he tells the lovers on the urn is much better it is far above human love because you will forever continue to love each other your love will continue to remain young and fresh forever so that is the end of stanza 3 now let's move on to stanza 4 who are these coming to the sacrifice to what green altar o mysterious priest leadest thou that haifa lowing at the skies and all her silken flanks with garlands dressed what little town by river or sea shore or mountain built with peaceful citadel is emptied of this folk this pipe this pious man and little town thy streets forever more will silent be and not a soul to tell why thou art desolate can ever return so this is my favorite uh, stanza in this poem and so he says now another picture he already presented us Uh, now another picture he already presented to us a picture of a musician playing the pipe and we also had the picture of the two lovers a lady running away from the bold lover now we go on to another picture on the urn and there we see a procession he he is asking the question now who are these so the first line who are these coming to the sacrifice now uh, he seems to be talking about a group of people who uh, are coming are uh, who form a procession and they are um, um, headed towards some place where there is going to be a sacrifice an animal sacrifice because the greeks of course were pagans and so animal a uh, sacrifice and such uh, ceremonies were common and so he says so where are you moving you where are you going to who are these coming to the sacrifice to what green altar or mysterious priest lead us thou so there is a priest in right in the front uh, uh, heading the procession and uh, maybe from his um, uh, the, uh, the the garb that he is wearing it is very clear that he is a priest so he is a mysterious priest because we don't know who this man is 
uh, where uh, which place he belongs to and so uh, to what altar so the altar where the sacrifice is going to be held cannot be seen on this uh, uh, urn but then he assumes that these people are moving towards an altar where the sacrifice is to be held and this mysterious priest is actually leading a haifa a haifa is a cow a cow uh, maybe there is a rope uh, tied around the neck of uh, the haifa and she is being dragged by this priest and the haifa is quite upset because uh, maybe the animal kind of I, I can already guess that it is being taken to be um, uh, you know to be offered as a sacrifice and so the haifa is lifting uh, her head towards the skies and lowing lowing crying wailing so where are you taking this animal Hmm? To what green altar, O mysteri oh mysterious priest, leadest thou that high for lowing at the skies, and all her silken flanks with garlands dressed? So her uh, sides, the flanks, the neck, and they are all. It is decorated with uh, garlands. Now this is not a very uncommon sight for us Indians because uh, we often, for some festivities, we have this uh, practice of decking up our cows with garlands and all that. And so here too, we have such an animal, uh, fully dressed with garlands, decorated with garlands. So she is being pulled towards an altar. And he wonders where this altar is and where this man is taking this haifa to. What little town by river or sea? Now he next he uh, focus, sh shifts his focus to uh, the town from where these people must have come. So what little town by river or seashore? So is it a town by a river? Is it a town by um, a seashore? Or is it a town somewhere in a near a, in a uh, in a mountainous place or mountain built with peaceful citadel? So a place where you have a fort. So is it a hilly town? Where are where are these people from? What little town by river or seashore a mountain built with peaceful citadel is emptied of its folk this pious morn? So he wonders which town is now empty because all the people are here now they're all on this urn it is a pious morn maybe it's a special day when some ceremony is held uh, and so everybody now earlier we know that we uh, when there was um, especially a religious ceremony all the people would participate now nowadays we are all busy with our work and even if it is a Diwali or if it is Pongal or if it is Onam, um, some of us might just remain at home, we sit glued to our television sets or looking into the uh, computer screens or looking at our mobiles. But earlier that was not the case. When such uh, ceremonies took place, everybody in the family, the whole village, they would all go to the um, a temple or the church or wherever or the mosque and they would all participate so here too he uh, thinks of such a situation and he wonders which town where is this town situated from where all these people have come here today and so as a result now the town is empty the town is emptied of its folk this pious morn and then now he's talking to the town the town that has been emptied and he tells and little town thy streets forevermore will silent be and not a soul to tell why thou art desolate can ever return so he tells the town you're going to be silent forever your streets are going to be silent forever because none of these people are going to come back and why are they not going to come back because they are stuck here on this urn and if at all somebody comes and asks what has happened to this town because it seems to be a very normal place with houses and it seems to be a town that has been inhabited by people but not a person is to be seen so some inquisitive person some curious passerby might ask what has happened to the people of this town but then nobody will give, be able to give an answer uh, they would ask the town why you are desolate, why you are deso deserted, why you are uh, kind of lonely, where are all the people? But not one person who can answer 
will be available because they are all here because all the people of the town all the towns men and towns women and the children they are all here on this urn none of them will be able to return to answer queries as to where they all disappeared to so that's a nice uh, way of uh, it's a kind of a twisted kind of an imagination but i really like the way keats has presented that so now he has given us detailed descriptions of the pictures on the urn and then we uh, go on to the last stanza now he goes back uh, so in the previous three stanzas he was talking about the various pictures on it now he once again talks to the urn o attic shape fair attitude with breed of marble men and maidens overwrought with forest branches and the trodden weed thou silent form dost tease us out of thought as doth eternity cold pastoral when old age shall this generation waste thou shall remain in midst of other woe than ours a friend to man to whom thou sayest beauty is truth truth beauty that is all ye know on earth and all ye need to know so he addresses uh, the urn once again as attic shape attic attic is anything related to greek greece is attic so uh, attic shape here he says the an urn made in the greek style fair attitude here it only means uh, something beautiful to look at beautiful urn attitude is the appearance the face or uh, the shape and the beauty of um, the urn is what he means by fair attitude with breed of marble men and maidens overwrought so here breed here means um, uh, braided the designs the complicated um, designs of trees and men and maidens and of marble men and maidens overwrought so here this overwrought can be interpreted in two ways one there are so many designs on this urn and so the urn is overwrought in the sense it is overfilled with designs that is one way to look at it or you can say that the men and the maidens on this urn are overwrought because all of them are excited the musician is very excitedly playing his pipe um, uh, the lover is very excitedly chasing his uh, lady love and she is in great e- excitement or fear or whatever she is running away from him and then there is another very excited procession of people moving towards uh, uh, an altar to sacrifice uh, the heif so uh, maybe he is saying that the marble men and maidens on the urn are overwrought so whatever okay with breed of marble men and maidens overall either the urn is overwrought with pictures either the urn is overwrought with pictures or the people on the urn are overwrought with their emotions with forest branches and the trodden weed so you can also see forest branches and uh, trodden weed because these people have been walking up and down and so you can see the trodden grass or the weed thou silent form dost tease us out of thought as that eternity so he says now slowly the tone changes he says though you are silent you tease us out of thought as that eternity you uh, kind of awaken some thoughts in us as that eternity now when you think of eternity eternity is uh, endless time so uh, when whenever uh, there is this thought of death or eternity uh human beings tend to get a little worried and worked up and so this uh, silent form or this urn it teases out of thought as that eternity it teases out or here teasing doesn't mean mocking it only i think means it slowly uh kind of prods us on and makes us think of deeper thoughts like eternity a teasing is when uh, when you try to slowly ease out something for instance the ring that you wear on your finger sometimes you wear a ring and then you don't remove it for a long time it gets stuck there because maybe you have grown fatter and so the ring doesn't come off so what do you do to remove it you apply some soap or some oil or something like that and you slowly twirl the ring around and that is the process of teasing it slowly out okay or when you have uh, 
maybe some beads or chains you put it all in a box and after some time when you try to take one you find that they are all tangled and then slowly you have to sit down there and you can't do it in a hurry you have to sit there and you have to strand by strand you have to tease them out one by one so that is teasing out so here well, i think what keats means is that the as you sit and look at this urn you slowly start thinking about very subtle things you are led into serious thoughts about life and death because this urn has been it is dead but at the same time it has been alive for such a long time we who think that we are alive will soon be dead but this urn which is considered to be an inanimate object continues to live for such a long time so looking at the urn and dwelling on the urn it prompts such deeper thoughts in us so that is what i think he means by saying it does tease us out of thought as death eternity and then cold pastoral he says okay so cold pastoral so there you can sense a tinge of an irritation or an anger because he calls this urn cold pastoral so cold again can either be just cold because this is a dead thing it is an inanimate object it has no life so it is cold and again marble uh, marble is also very cool to touch so altogether it is cold that way then another way when you say when you say that somebody is cold you definitely don't uh, uh, say that in a tone of appreciation it's meant as a derogatory kind of a term when you say that somebody is cold you mean to say that that person is indifferent that the person doesn't care for you um, unemotional so here this urn is cold because in a phase it pastoral because it has all these pastoral Uh, scenes depicted on it so that is easily explained so this coldness might be its detachment its aloofness its indifference to the sufferings of man because it has been witnessing it has been sitting there and witnessing so many generations pass by but it doesn't react it just, just sits there so that is why he seems to be calling it cold pastoral when old age shall uh, this generation waste thou shall remain so he says uh, this generation that is the present generation of keats uh, himself he says that very soon we will die keats of course was always aware of his impending death because he knew he was sick but otherwise it is you would grow old and you would die so he says this present generation of mine we would grow old and we will die waste here only means die uh, get uh, degenerate and just um, uh, uh, fade away from this the face of this earth but even then you will still remain here in midst of other woe than ours a friend to man so you will continue to remain here as fresh as you are now and you will be able to witness other woes than ours means the next generation will come and they will have their own woes woes means trouble you know that woe means sorrow or trouble so you will sit here just like you are looking at me and listening to me you will listen to other people you will witness different kinds of sufferings of different generations you will continue to be a friend to man to whom thou sayest and he says this is what the urn is telling us this is the message now the last two lines very famous lines um uh, it is believed that it is the urn that is telling these two lines to us or to keats so this is a message that the urn wishes to pass on to the human beings beauty is truth truth beauty that is all you know on earth and all you need to know so the urn tells us that beauty is truth and truth beauty now truth and beauty are two uh, concepts that are often uh, discussed in uh, relation to art and so beauty here does not refer to external beauty something that is peripheral but it refers to the everlasting beauty uh, and that is why he says that beauty is truth and truth beauty these to anything that is truly beautiful is the ultimate truth and same way the ultimate truth is always beautiful A truth is something uh, the discovery of which makes your life worth living 
and beauty is something that would always continue to give happiness and joy something that is eternal something that has no death so true beauty and uh, the real truth both are things that last forever and so that is the message that this uh, urn gives us that beauty is truth and truth beauty in the sense that uh, what matters in life ultimately is the discovery of truth and beauty and it also gives the message that art actually symbolizes both beauty and truth a work of art whether it is literature or whether it is sculpture whether it is a painting whether it's a poem uh, a work of beauty it remains forever it continues to entertain and um, inspire generations of people because it has in it an element of truth and only truth truth is that which can outrun the passage of time uh, a similar idea there is uh, this thing about truth in the poem called uh, ozymandias by shelley where uh, he talks about a great king called ozymandias who uh, had ordered that a huge statue of his be built he wanted to let the world know of his power but many years later when a traveler passed by he saw a dilapidated ruined statue lying in the sands of the desert and uh, the the head of the statue is lying half sunk in the mud but then even though it is lying half sunk in the mud he can see the the beauty and the uh, the originality of the expression or, or the emotions depicted on the particular face and then he appreciates the artist who made the statue because the artist has been able uh, has succeeded in capturing the real emotion of the king so the king's power the king himself is no more his power is no more but art still continues to exist so same way here too the only thing that remains eternal is art it is only uh, uh, true beauty and truth alone can uh, remain forever so maybe the urn is telling man that don't worry that you are short lived because human beings are and all other things on earth are meant for a short life only art can transcend and live beyond eternity so uh, that is um, it is kind of uh, i don't know whether i have given a satisfactory explanation of those lines because those lines are the most disputed lines and uh, many critics have spoken uh, Uh, in derogatory terms about these lines and there is also a, a, a critic who has said that in the whole poem it is just these two lines that are worth reading and so that's why i told you in the beginning this this poem is variously interpreted and variously judged so i have only attempted to explain it as i have understood and these are considered to be the most difficult lines in a poem because it's um, it's very tricky and Uh, Keats alone can explain what he means by this particular line but anyway i guess the message is that art is eternal mm, that is undisputed that art is eternal and it will continue to exist it is continue to exist uh, forever so that is uh, um, i have attempted here a kind of uh, an explanation of the i have just tried to interpret the poem I've not gone deep into the stylistic devices used i would suggest that uh, each of you of course there is a lot you would find a lot of studies on this poem and lot of interpretations so those who are uh, really keen can definitely do a lot of reference on it and just as i have arrived at an interpretation you too may arrive at your own interpretation of these very very enigmatic lines of the poem So that is all that I have to say about this beautiful poem titled Ode on a Grecian Urn.